September 1978, the Murphy Gulch Fire devoured thousands of acres in the foothills of the Ken Carroll Valley. This video, narrated by Jim Antes, explains how the fire started and the efforts to extinguish the flames, enhanced with actual 1978 footage of the fire from KUSA 9 News and clippings from five area newspapers. The Murphy Gulch Fire highlighted the difficulties of managing a fire when 43 different fire departments from five counties respond. This film, The Murphy Gulch Fire, was produced in 2021 by a committee of the Ken Carroll Ranch Historical Society. This group includes Jim Antes, Mary Antes, Linda Omdahl, Marilyn Elrod, Marilyn Norris, and Ann Frizz. John Foschholt, a Ken Carroll resident and former employee of Denver Channel 9 TV, provided a connection to that television station from which video of news coverage of the fire was obtained. The Ken Carroll Ranch Historical Society Committee has produced many other videos describing the history of the ranch, its original residents, its former owners, and the development of the community. Ken Carroll residents who hike, bike, or ride up into the foothills on ranch property may encounter the sight of fallen timber, dead trees and stumps tattooed with burn scars. These are remnants of a large forest fire that burned thousands of acres on the Ken Carroll Ranch. The fire started in Murphy Gulch, south of Ken Carroll Ranch, on the morning of Sunday, September 10th, 1978, when two children, seven and ten years old, were in the backyard building a campfire. When it got out of control, the girl's parents tried frantically to stop the blaze. The flames spread quickly to the nearby dry grass and then northeasterly onto Ken Carroll Ranch land. At 10.40 a.m., a security guard at the recently completed Johns Manville World Headquarters, now Lockheed Martin, noticed smoke in the foothills above the building and contacted authorities. Quickly on the scene were the Inter Canyon Fire Company and the Bancroft, now West Metro, Fire Department, as well as the Johns Manville Fire Brigade. Smoke from the fire could be seen from the original Elish Gardens in northwest Denver, where Johns Manville employees had gathered for their annual picnic. As these JM employees hurriedly attempted to report to headquarters, a security guard was stopped for speeding. The patrol officer asked why she was going so fast. To a fire? The Johns Manville World Headquarters building became the fire headquarters. Volunteers, JM personnel, and other citizens who reported there were given picks and shovels and joined the fire line. Denver media arrived. Radio and television news people and camera operators, plus newspaper reporters and photographers, established posts on the headquarters roof and in the parking lot. Also situated on the roof was the feeding line for the firefighting volunteers. Food and drink were made available by neighbors, spouses of the volunteers, the Red Cross, and the Jefferson County Emergency Preparedness Department. Johns Manville bought out two local grocery store supplies of sandwich materials, soft drinks, and coffee. Bologna sandwiches with mayonnaise became a symbol of the event. By late Sunday afternoon, the volunteer force had been enlarged by about 150 Lowry Air Force Base airmen. Since regulations did not allow Air Force officials to assign volunteer military personnel, these young off-duty enlistees got into formation and marched from 6th Avenue in Quebec as far as Kipling and Hamden. There, a sympathetic service station manager used his citizens' band radio to rouse rides for them. By nightfall of the first day, the wind calmed, but orange, blazing hot spots and heavy smoke could still be seen in downtown Denver. Here is a report from the first day, September 10th, 
from a KUSA news team in Denver. The Inner Canyon Fire Department got the first call on the Murphy Gulch fire about 11.30 this morning. It wasn't hard to find, with its dense smoke spiraling skyward. Almost immediately, the Bancroft and Elk Creek Fire Departments were called in. And by 1 p.m., the fire had spread to a point that even more help from Evergreen and Idledale was called for. The gusty winds and dead timber killed by pine beetles made control of the blaze impossible. It began heading toward the Ken Carroll West subdivision, an exclusive area featuring homes costing $200,000 and more. One of those homes belongs to former astronaut Wally Shira, and family and neighbors began taking important belongings out, not sure the fire would be stopped before it got to the house. While the Bancroft firefighters wet down the adjoining area with lots of available water, a neighbor began wetting down the house. The effort was successful, but the beautiful trees in the area were charred and burned. In the sky, Jefferson County Sheriff's Department helicopters used 250-gallon buckets to dump water on the hot spots, but the fire kept spreading. And by 4.45 or so, it began spreading toward the $70 million world headquarters of the Johns Manville Company. Many members of the company's volunteer fire department were on a picnic and responded to the call, wetting down the areas near the plant along with help from the Bancroft firefighters. At about 10.30 a.m., the fire advanced down the South Hillside Slope behind the Johns Manville Headquarters building and burned into the buffalo grass around the south side of the parking lot, forcing firefighters and volunteers to haul miles of heavy canvas hose up the steep hill. The Rocky Mountain News reported that 70 mile per hour wind gusts pushed the fire within horseshoe pitching distance of the aluminum skinned sides of the headquarters building. From the early morning hours until noon, the fire moved south to within 75 yards of the Johns Manville building. From behind the front line, photographer Butch Montoy and I got this close look at just how it spreads. When the wind gusts, what was a safe spot is suddenly in the path of the blaze. The fire moves quickly, feeding on dry grass, shrubs and trees. Efforts to dig fire lines by hand become useless. The ground is rock solid. Today, when the fire burned toward the headquarters, the volunteers had to abandon the hill. Only pumpers and slurry bombing helicopters are any help in stopping the quick spread. Once the fire was contained in front of the building, it moved west along Deer Creek Road. Back in this area, the homes were evacuated this morning. A lonely, meager crew tried to beat the hot spots down from the top. Unattended, this flare up from the north expected to smolder throughout the night. About the only area where the fire seems to have burned all it can is due west, near the Murphy's Gulch housing development. The manor house became the firefighting headquarters, where helicopters with water buckets shuttled between the helipad and the fire line. Governor Richard Lamb, who called in the Colorado State Forest Service, received hourly briefings on the blaze. He was also asked to use his influence to settle a problem of jurisdiction, a stalemate developed between the contractors from Ken Carroll Corporation and Bancroft personnel over use of bulldozers and other heavy equipment. About 3 p.m., a weather front moved in over the mountains and shifted the winds toward the north and west into the foothills. Two Forest Service slurry bombers converted World War II bombing aircraft from Jefferson County Airport dropped fire retardant. Kincaid Ranch Corporation bulldozers were used to dredge fire lines on the hillsides. You don't realize what a helicopter can do until you run into something like this. Try to get a look at the fire that really tells you how much has burned. You have to get back and up in Sky Nine. 3,000 acres was the last estimate we had, and this map shows what our helicopter tour indicates was burned. Deer Creek Canyon Road stopped it on the south, but it had plenty of room to maneuver. Dozens of houses are in the blackened area, but only three buildings have burned so far, one of them a guest house and one a barn. 
And helicopters get a lot of the credit for that, too. Two choppers have been flying since Sunday. This one carries 360 gallons of water in one trip. It belongs to the Bureau of Land Management. When one chopper would spot a fire threatening a building, it took only four minutes to head back, load up with water, and drop it right on the house. All through the area, there are houses that are surrounded by scorched earth. When people couldn't get to them in time, the choppers saved them. John's Manville even had spotter helicopters trying to determine where help was needed. Sky 9 hasn't been alone in the air this week. Slurry bombers, like the one that dumped chemicals on our crew today, helicopters carrying spotters or saving buildings, fought this one from above. From Sky 9, Tom Kirby, 9 News. Firefighting continued, with the flames working their way north toward Massey Draw and the Manor House. To prevent an expansion of the blaze into Turkey Creek Canyon, firefighters used bulldozers and chainsaws to cut a honeycomb of fire breaks along the northwest edge. The Rocky Mountain News reported that convoys of federal government trucks had carried 15 bulldozers from all over the state to the fire's hot spots. A command post was set up at Mountain High Chapel on U.S. Highway 285 near Tiny Town. Another hot spot flared up, this one clearly visible from downtown Denver. That's been the story for these firefighters, a constant mop-up that never seems to end. It's just so dry and it, it burns in the duff underneath, it burns in the roots underneath, and then it flares up and it's gone. There's just not much you can do with it. are exhausted. They've had it. And until there is a good rain, hot spots like this one will continue. By Friday, the fire was described as contained by the Colorado State Forest Service. Crews were still at work extinguishing smokes, such as smoldering tree trunks, which could flare up if the winds returned, and starting mop-up operations. The fire eventually encompassed about 3,300 acres, extending as far north as the Willowbrook neighborhood, where residents hosed down their rooftops, and as far east as the grassy areas near the manor house. No lives were lost, and property damage was kept to a minimum. The only structure burned was a guest house on a nearby ranch. Although there were homes on the plains and on the West Ranch, houses in the Ken Carroll Valley had not yet been built. The equestrian center, then still a cattle operation, was not damaged, although 500 head of Black Angus cattle needed to be herded by pickup truck to a safer pasture further south in the valley. According to the Lakewood Sentinel, the fire cost $150,000 per day at its peak. No charges were filed against the children. During the time that the fire was out of control, over 1,000 individuals manned the fire lines. The wildlife seemed to have survived as well, with little impact on the animals. Arch Andrews of the Colorado Wildlife Division stated that no animal carcasses were found. Numerous mule deer, frightened and out of breath, were observed escaping to the west. A bear with two cubs and a mountain lion were spotted. Coyotes have moved into some areas. The Forest Service says that coyotes instinctively go into a burn area searching for mice who have lost their grass cover. The Johns Manville World Headquarters suffered heavy smoke damage. During the fire, the building was closed on Monday and Tuesday. Johns Manville volunteers continuously worked the fire lines. Throughout the fire, the management team, the security guards, building engineers, the receptionists, the telephone operators, and even members of the contracted cleaning crew were on the scene. Humans always seem to repair faster than the rest of nature. John's Manville went back to business as usual already this morning. 
the charred half-bald foothills now only the backdrop for their amphitheater of employee parking. The Murphy Gulch fire highlighted the difficulties of managing a fire when 43 different fire departments from five counties respond. The firefighters were managed by a command staff with a representative from each cooperating agency providing input for how to attack the fire. Each agency brought its own communication systems and command protocol. As the fire spread into multiple jurisdictions, a different agency would take command, requiring the entire staff to adjust to a new command. This caused confusion and alienation among the management staff, as well as counterproductive measures by firefighters on the ground. For example, firefighters from one agency would extinguish a backburn started by another. Consequently, the Colorado State Forest Service adopted the Fire Scope Program to deal with multi-jurisdictional issues in future fires. Ken Carroll volunteers planted more than 1,500 ponderosa pine seedlings. Helicopters did aerial reseeding of the grassy hillsides. The burned tree snags were left in place until an infestation of the pine beetle was discovered in 1980 that required the removal of most of the dead and damaged timber. The dead trees, some of which can be seen silhouetted against the sky from the valley floor, serve as a reminder that residents who live in the wildland urban interface must be vigilant of the associated risks and take precautions to protect ourselves and our property.